I'd like to thank the many people who've responded to the videos with comments, criticisms and suggestions. And thanks to Maciej Remisievski for pointing out that I showed a picture of the wrong Walter van der Kamp in episode 64. This is the picture I intended to show. My sincere apologies for the mistake. Quite a few people have requested more about the mathematics being used to bamboozle us into thinking some things which are nonsense are very clever. Many people are afraid of mathematics. They think it's too hard to understand. I don't think that's really true, but maths is often not explained as simply as it could be. Let's start off with the very basics, numbers. The basis of mathematics is the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Kronecker acknowledged that these were made by God, because as far back in time as we have records, all people of all civilizations have counted fingers, cattle, children and so on. And that didn't need the input of mathematicians. These numbers were part of every language which God has given to mankind. But mathematicians have extended the counting numbers. They've added negative numbers. Quite an intellectual jump. After all, you can't see minus two cows or minus three fingers, so you can't actually count them. But you can use negative numbers in calculations. The same with zero. So the mathematicians made a bigger set of numbers called the integers. Negative numbers and zero, as well as the counting numbers. But they didn't stop there. There are numbers like a half and five over four, which are called the rational numbers, because they deal with the ratio of two integers, one divided by the other. Unfortunately, they weren't called the ratio numbers, which might have made sense. They were called rational numbers, which suggests that they're somehow the only reasonable numbers. Then it was found that there are some numbers, like the square root of three, which can't be written as one number divided by another. The square root of a number is the number which, when multiplied by itself, gives that number. So the square root of nine is three, because three times three is nine, and the square root of four is two, because two times two is four. But you can't find a number which multiplied by itself gives three. By trial and error, we find it must be more than 1.73, but less than 1.74. Trying to get closer, we find it must be between 1.732050 and 1.732051. But no matter how many decimals we try, you never find a number which, when multiplied by itself, gives exactly three. This means it can't be a ratio number, because one integer divided by another always has a definite decimal value or else the numbers repeat forever, like 1 divided by 3 equals 0.33333 and on and on. It would make sense to call numbers like the square root of 3 non-ratio numbers, but sadly mathematicians decided on the name irrational numbers, which suggests it's an unreasonable number of some kind. So the mathematicians put together the counting numbers, zero, the negative numbers, the rational numbers and the irrational numbers and called them the real numbers. The real numbers can be represented on a number line. Every place on this line has either an integer a rational number, an irrational number, or zero. The line is fully packed with real numbers. There are no empty spaces. With these numbers, we can do many wonderful calculations. But there are some very simple-looking calculations which can't be done with them. For example, the simple equation, x squared plus 1 equals naught. The solution 
must be x is the square root of minus 1. But no real number qualifies. No real number times itself gives anything close to minus 1. It can't be a positive number, because positive number times positive number gives another positive number. It can't be a negative number, because a negative number times a negative number is also a positive number. And it can't be zero, since zero times zero is zero, not minus one. So mathematicians decided to call the square root of minus one the imaginary number, even though nobody can imagine what it might be like. It's usually given the symbol little i. A lot of algebra was developed dealing with the imaginary numbers. Then a mathematician called Argand showed that a diagram called the Argand diagram could represent this algebra in a plane having one axis with the real numbers and an axis at right angles to it with i times the real numbers. The axis of real numbers is called the real axis. The other is called the imaginary axis. Every point on the Argand diagram, which is not on an axis, has a real part and an imaginary part. Such a number is called a complex number. The Argand diagram was very convenient because all the mathematics of coordinate geometry could be applied to complex numbers. The maths of complex numbers could be applied to real problems. Electrical engineering, for example. In electrical circuits, conductors and resistors have voltage and current synchronised. As voltage increases, current increases. They are in phase with each other. But other components are not like that. Capacitors and inductors have voltages and current out of phase. In capacitors, the current lags behind the voltage. In inductors, the voltage lags behind the current. This can make calculating what goes on in circuits quite difficult. But representing the out-of-phase parts by imaginary numbers makes the problem much easier. Electrical engineers always call the current I. So they call the imaginary number J to avoid confusion. When the calculation's finished, any term with the imaginary number J in it is out of phase, and any number with no J is in phase. Complex numbers can be very useful for other problems too. But at the end of the calculation, the imaginary numbers are eliminated, or they're interpreted as something with a physical meaning, like phase. Well, they are, if the calculations are done by people like engineers, who deal with the real world. But ever since Cantor, mathematicians have considered they can base their mathematics on constructs of their own minds, and the imaginary number is certainly a construct of a mathematical mind. So, mathematician Minkowski reasoned like this. Time multiplied by velocity gives distance, which is a length. I think we can agree with that. 10 miles per hour multiplied by 2 hours gives 20 miles. Now, Einstein, by a cunning definition about the way he wanted light to work, made the speed of light a constant to every observer anywhere in the universe. So, reasoned Minkowski, if I take Einstein's speed of light as a fundamental constant and multiply it by time, I have a fundamental length or distance. Space consists of length, breadth and height. They form three axes at right angle to each other and they all have the units of length or distance. So, if I multiply the speed of light by time 
and by the imaginary number, I'll make another axis at right angles to the other three, just as in the Argand diagram. That will get four completely equivalent dimensions, which I can call space-time. Hey, is this a joke? Soddy pointed out that this was the first time that a physical meaning was attached to a mathematical result from which I had not been eliminated. And how can four axes be right angles to each other anyway? Well, that may be impossible for mere mortals who live in the real world like us. But to a mathematician, it's child's play. Now, anyone with his feet on the ground might have said, mathematicians do all sorts of amusing things when they play with numbers, but we don't always need to take them seriously. But surprise, surprise, the theoretical physicist said, oh, what a wonderful idea, we really must live in a four-dimensional space-time continuum. But there were some scientists with a bit of common sense. Remember what Frederick Soddy called those mathematicians? Heaven-sent magicians able to make time and space equivalent. And it would be as well to take seriously what Soddy said about those heaven-sent magicians. But the real liars today are the mathematicians, if you are fool enough to believe them. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.